Hello and welcome to All Faith Keepers. We are so grateful you have joined us for season one of this beautiful series and conversations with faith keepers about their faith and how they keep their faith. We are so grateful for the support, subscribing and following and sharing of these episodes that has helped build this community on Instagram, Facebook, and on YouTube. So thank you for those that have invited their friends, especially friends of other faiths, to join these conversations with us. We love to see your comments and your feedback. And today you are in for a treat. I feel like I told Louisa, it feels like she's the white whale. And I don't mean that disparagingly because I know there's marine biologists out there that may argue with me about, but she feels like the gem of guests that I could have dreamed into existence because she has such a beautiful tapestry of a faith journey and education. So without further ado, would you share what your bio is, the way you like to introduce yourself? Yeah. I, I could say a lot of things about you, but I like to have guests introduce themselves because then they say the things they want to be known for. So yeah, you know, it's not something I have down pat, but my name is Louisa Fowler Packham. My husband and I live in Cambridge, Massachusetts right now, but we are moving to Southern California this summer. Wow. Um, yeah, we're really excited. I got my bachelor's degree in religion and I got my master's degree from Boston University in theology and I'm starting my PhD in the fall. So in um, Mormon studies or religion and I'm super excited about it and I'm thrilled to be here. Well, I'm so excited right there. It is like a privilege to talk with you because you kind of are living my dream world. Like I got a degree in education and a minor in psychology and I have not gotten a master's, but you studied things that I've always, if I was to go back, I would love to study. Where are you studying in Southern California? So I will be at Claremont Graduate University. Okay. Uh, which and they I have never a, said about. Yeah. They have a Mormon studies program. They do. I think it's the only like, like, specifically Mormon studies program, okay. at least for now, but it's within the Department of Religion. Um, but it's it's such a unique opportunity. And my husband and I were so blessed that his dream job is in the same region of the country as my dream academic program. So wow, I love yeah. God. God moves mountains for us, yep. right? Indeed. Well, for our audience, they know that this this whole um, community was built around the idea that when we learn about other faiths, we are inspired to keep our faith and that having a really strong educational foundation and curiosity, I think serves us in, um, building community. If for Christians out there that are waiting for Jesus to come, the vernacular I would use in building Zion, it's really important that we have some kind of holy envy of one another. And that curiosity, I heard you interviewed on another show, Saints Unscripted with my son, who's one of the hosts over on Saints Unscripted, fun fact. <laughs> and I was so connected with so many things you were sharing, your vulnerability, your honesty, but um, your educational training and background is like just straight up holy envy on my side. But also I loved hearing kind of the personal ways in which faith has enabled you to navigate life and human experience. And to me, that's why interfaith conversations are so inspiring. I never leave a faith conversation with someone where I don't feel closer to who I define as God and more inspired to practice my faith my way. And it's usually because they share a very unique perspective different from mine. So that doesn't scare me. And I feel like we are like bosom friends in that way. Like we have a very similar passion about these kinds of conversations. And so I'm excited today because I feel like you get to share with us not only your perspective educationally and academically with theology studies, but where your faith was growing up and where your faith is now, which is from Catholicism to being a Mormon or a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And so that's why our audience is getting like, you're like the triple threat interview for me. Uh, so yeah. can we kind of start with that beginnings of your life and being raised in a family of faith? And what was that like? And, and how did yeah. you how did you experience faith as a child and growing up? Yeah, I, I love I, I love the idea to start there. And I think honestly, to really set the scene of my faith journey, I have to quickly um, 
do a nod to my grandparents um, who my, my mom's parents raised their four children in a Catholic home in, a, in an exceptionally devout Catholic home. Um, and they met at a Catholic university and uh, my grandfather taught at a Catholic university for a few years before the family moved um, out east. And they experienced as young parents a profound tragedy they lost a child in a um in like a freak accident and my grandmother is now in her early 90s and she can describe in clarity the way that she called upon god to work through that tragedy and um you can just see how that has set the tone for my mother and me and my two brothers just knowing that faith and divinity is something that you can call upon when things get hard uh, was an incredibly important thing to start with so fast forward my mom um marries my dad and they meet in new york city and she he my my father was raised loosely episcopalian religion was not um a main theme in his life but my mom told him we need to raise our children catholic that's a priority for me and my dad signed up for that and that's what they did i mean we were at mass every single sunday growing up and i went to ccd received my first holy communion confirmation etc um, and my dad was there every Sunday too. And and it and you hear about that in the LDS faith as well of non-active parents showing up for their um, spouses and children. But I, I think it was really it 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 provided me with a sense of security in my understanding of faith. It was I mean it was clear to me from a young age that Catholicism was not as important to him as it was to my mom but the fact that he went and he respected it and he participated it made me feel like i had a secure footing to explore the catholic church and so i'm grateful for that what a yeah. beautiful window into um what your grandparents gave their posterity one of the things i talk a lot with my children and i shared this with you before we started taping my grandmother um, was an active practicing Catholic and went to mass every week and wore the veil and then married my grandfather who was not an active Mormon. And then eventually he reactivated and she joined and converted to the LDS faith. And I still have what we call as a temple envelope, which is one of her Catholic veils. She had two Catholic she had her veil turned into two temple envelopes and saved one because I was a baby until I went to the temple. And for those that are LDS will understand what that means. So every time I worship in the temple, especially with the endowment, I hold this very strong interfaith um, symbol in my hand. And I'm reminded of how faith was so important to her. And sometimes what I love about what your grandparents went through is it is often in our tragedies that we teach our children what faith really looks like in live action, you know, like yeah. the how of our faith instead of the what and the why. Sometimes yeah. we talk about a lot when we worship and when we study. I also shared with you, um, not a lot of our audience may know this, my, my sister that passed by suicide and I attended a Catholic church, uh, school when we were little and my mom was a single mom. And so I very much have a respect. My dearest friend from junior high and high school, who is still my friend and we're in our fifties is a practicing Catholic. So I would attend mass with her often. And so I just think there's this beautiful way in which you share what is common in why we need interfaith relationships is because your father and your mother's dynamic is playing out in lots of faiths and lots Absolutely. of homes. Absolutely. And your grandparents could have gone through that same tragedy and not connected it with faith. But now their grandchildren can look to that as an example of where God can show up in our lives when there's tragedy. I just love that. When you were yeah. a child, what, what are some of your fond memories of like, what did you enjoy about practicing your faith and, or what were some of the traditions that 
created for you connection with family or with God? Because I think sometimes children, we want them to have informed consent, but we give them a fabric and a foundation of faith when we practice tradition. And I think that's a really healthy mental health tool. I don't think it's not informed consent. I think it's like, our family culture, we go to church. Our family culture, we have midnight mass for Christmas or whatever that is. Or on Easter, we do this, or we have this tradition. I think that gives children really, like you said, solid foundation and connection. Yeah. And maybe it doesn't look like informed consent when they make covenants or get baptized or whatever. But I don't, I don't see the risk of that. I think there's value in that because it gives children a community to grow up in. In my, do you agree with that? Do you I disagree? Do. No, I, I really, I absolutely do. And um, I just, I do want to backpedal to what you said about your grandmother and just say how beautiful that image is. I don't want like too much time to go without acknowledging that. Thank and you. I, I really do think it speaks to the convert experience of you never leave your foundation behind and you no. bring it with you as you gain more light and truth. And so I just think that's a beautiful symbol of that. Uh, but to answer your question more specifically about fond, happy memories, I think I think what's great about um, the Catholic Church, and I, I think that the LDS faith does this well also, is to your point about when you're really little and you know, you're practicing infant baptism or even receiving your first Holy Communion at seven, I do think, and I can define that ordinance more if that feels necessary, but um, I, I don't know that I was accessing spirituality in the way that we might immediately define it in the sense that I don't know that I felt as a girl that I could call upon Christ or receive any sort of revelation, but I think that's more than okay because I was learning to embody faith. And what I mean by that is, as I said, I was at mass every Sunday after I received my Holy Communion, I was taking the Eucharist or the sacrament. I was learning to be respectful to ordained clergy, which is a distinction between Catholicism and the LDS. Um, but also I was going to religious education education classes with other children and we were trying to access spirituality with the guidance of our teachers and i think there's really something to be said about maybe it doesn't feel like that sticking divine revelatory thing that we maybe want or our parents want for us but i think that it it, it gets ingrained in our bodies and in our spirits with the Rep, the physical repetition of showing up and doing the things. And I do think Christ meets people there. And so, yes. um, and that was true. I mean, you asked about childhood and girlhood and, and that was true then, but it was also true when I went to college, I was in upstate New York at this really tiny college and um, I studied religion, but that was not like a peak time of religious security for me. Um, and I didn't feel like I had a super strong relationship with Jesus Christ or God in any capacity. However, I went to mass every single Sunday with my friends. It was like I developed an exceptionally close relationship with um, the Catholic chaplain at the school. And I showed up and I did the things and I took the sacrament and I made connections and community with people who were doing the same things. And I think that when I finally was converted unto Christ through my LDS faith, I think that the spiritual personal aspect of it was so familiar because I had prepared myself through the actions. I love that example of how as a mom of adult children that are in their 20s that are navigating, deciding what faith their parents gave them and now what are they going to keep or what are they going to add to or how are they going to change that? Yeah. I've watched both my children. I have a daughter currently serving a full-time LDS mission. I have a son who you know that yep. served the mission and came home and had his own journey of, you know, I've watched him even deep in his roots and that has come with some probably bumpy roads. And so for all the parents of any faith listening to this conversation, 
I love the idea that you had catechism and you took your first communion. And I'm imagining Ash Wednesday and Lent and yeah. all these times where your parents and your church teachers were trying to give you like the ingredients to make the cake and then college I just think college that era and season is a lot about like I don't really want to bake with cinnamon I don't know if I want to use cornstarch yeah okay I've never baked with vanilla before but I'm going to try it yeah and so for parents out there they're maybe gripping a little tight because they're worried of how the cake is going to turn out or all of a sudden your child is like I don't like to buy make cakes I want to make pies now yeah and you're like wait we grew up making cakes why yeah. are you making pies you know yeah. and I just love that for me too when I went to college all of a sudden I was away from my family of origin and I was in an LDS college and I was dealing with my mental health stuff and I was asking questions in a deep, deeper way but there was these foundational traditions that felt like home. And so when I would go to worship on Sunday in an LDS congregation, it was a connection to home. Yeah. And I think, thank you for acknowledging my grandmother often said she didn't let her Catholicism go. In the words of Joseph Smith, she added to. And, yeah. and so thank you for giving us a little window into that next season of where you took those ingredients and during a time where traditionally I think we are exploring identity and what do we believe and do we believe this because our parents believed it or do we want to keep it or do we not that you still return to these places that created community and connection and I think college kids find a church it doesn't have to be your parents yeah. church but find a church it's a good place to kind of ground every week so you can do that week of exploring that's coming up you know yeah. 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 And to do it in community and, um, no, it's, it's a really powerful, useful thing. And, and as you're talking about motherhood and this idea of, you know, releasing your children into the wild, I'm not a mother. And so I don't, I can't completely wrap my head around how scary that would be. But the example that keeps coming to my mind is, um, the Amish and their tradition of the rum springa which yes. is for those who don't know it's um, when children or teenagers are transitioning into adulthood the amish traditionally um invite their children to leave the community and break traditions of you know they'll wear blue jeans or they'll eat at a restaurant or use technology right and exactly i think their idea is then they can really make that informed decision of I've seen what's on the other side of this. And I decide either the Amish tradition is the happiest, most stable life for me, or there's something else out there. And that like talk about an act of faithful stewardship on yes. the behalf of those parents and the community. I just, and I think there's so much merit to that. Yes. And what, it, this is why you're such a beautiful guest to have, because I think that's a perfect segue into this kind of middle point that I'd love to talk on more of your study of theology and understanding yeah. of others. What a perfect example. I love reading anything about Amish community because yeah. they very much are dedicated to their family and their faith. And like you said, they know that there's this unique season for all of us in our progression where we're transitioning from childhood to adulthood and we're deciding, do we keep this or do we not? In Mormon yeah. scripture, there's a really great couple of stories that show that that was a bumpy time, even for prophets, children that went a little walky, you know, like yeah. King Mosiah and Alma's kids went a little crazy for a while. And then they yeah. kind of came back and they were these great witnesses to their faith because they had chosen another way for a while. Yeah. So what other things did you, would you like to talk about on studying theology and divinity and understanding from like a more academic standpoint, and really, I have no agenda on this part. Yeah. I really would just love you to just say what maybe God is putting on your heart of like, yeah. give us a peek into what you learned about a certain religion or what did you understand as you did some deep dives in, in yeah. theology? Okay, the thought that just popped into my brain that I think would be a great introduction into this. My freshman year of my undergraduate, I took a seminar course on um, Navajo creation stories. And so Navajo is a Native American um, group 
tribe tradition. And um, it's very important when we talk about Native American tradition to recognize that it's not necessarily religion. They're spiritual, divine aspects, but they don't categorize it necessarily as religion. And so it's important to talk about it without sort of mapping our views onto it. I just always like to caveat that just because respect. So what I, what I hear you saying, which is a really beautiful point, is that it's almost so integrated in their way of life that they don't yeah. see it as maybe separate as right. a religion. It's, it's just right. It's just their the threads of how they speak and and what they practice, but yep. it's not a separate religion they identify as. It's not temporal versus spiritual. It's just reality. And I'll take this even a step further to something that like blew my 19 year old mind into just like a million tiny pieces, <laughs> which is um my fascination with love relationship community started in high school and I got really excited in college about talking about love and family in the context of religion and I really wanted to write um, my final paper for this course on the Navajo on um, their idea of love and we had this amazing opportunity a professional like authentic Navajo storyteller because they do have members of their community their title is storyteller um, I love this, that. yeah and this woman was a friend of my professors and she showed up on our campus and she told us all these stories and then she sort of fielded some questions and I proposed this paper topic to her about Navajo families and Navajo love and how that connects with their idea of creation. And she said, the Navajo don't even have a word that directly translates to love. And that's not an emotion that they articulate, right? And I, um, I, was like, I was like, I cannot imagine that being possible. They have a different, the closest emotion that they articulate, I'm just not even going to try to say it because I'll just so poorly, but, but it translates to my mind is seeing your mind. Um, so like in yoga, it would be namaste. It would be like, m m I bow my spirit bows to your spirit. Yeah. And, but I think like, to me, it was like, the more I talked to her about it, it was like, it was empathy. Like I am able to oh. understand exactly what's going on for you but that's that's where their like deepest connections happen and in that moment i was like okay so there are groups of people out there who are just experiencing what i deem to be like the most fundamental realities of being a person they're experiencing them like in this completely different way and it 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 really did catalyze a journey of just always always entering into spaces acknowledging things that I assume are truths, they're not going to be truths for other people. And, and I found that in every group and tradition and religion that I explored. And, and what it did for me personally was it challenged me to show up in spaces with a posture of inquiry as opposed to like, um, impositional authority. And and it's and it's been really hard and every day i realize how little i know but it's also been really cool and it, and and yeah it's it's just done like a world of good for me at every step of the way wow wow yeah. i just, you literally have strengthened me in why it's been so slow in building all faiths but why yeah that is the why because that holy envy or that curiosity is such an expansive way to see the world uh, and i think sometimes for those of us that practice our faith and we are all in on our faith it can sometimes be that we don't experience as much uncertainty because we think we have some absolutes yeah and there's a fine line between like absolute faith and making space for curiosity and learning. And I it's think so true. we can't build community. We can't build Zion. Whatever you believe is coming. If we don't have some of that, 
And yet I don't want my Jewish friends and my Muslim friends to feel like they have to set anything aside to be them. Like I want them to come with their absolutes and their understanding their bold beliefs. Yeah. And yet I love your idea of like at age 53, I know how much I don't know every day now. Yeah. When I was in my twenties and thirties, I felt like I knew a lot. I was yeah. like, Oh, I think I know this and I don't need to worry about that. And I know there's brain science about how you can't walk into every situation as if you don't know something or else your brain wouldn't actually be able to like yeah. function. You have to walk in and go, that's a desk. That's a light. I know what it's going to do. But when it comes to people, isn't that beautiful? God's divinity is found in our diversity and that it is, but that you could talk to someone that is seeped in Navajo tradition and what could they teach us about empathy and connection? Because we just label it, you know, as love. A friend of mine served an LDS mission in Russia, and she was just telling me their language is so expansive mm. that um, it. we were talking about a family that has immigrated from Russia to America, and they've joined the church, the wow. LDS church. And they sit crying because they don't have language, but the Russian language is so much more expansive. So they wouldn't walk into a room and say, look at this beautiful white room with the white couch. They would have like 12 other layers. Of and yeah. yeah. And so I think what if we never, one of the beautiful things of this, this community that I'm trying to build is that exact teaching you just shared. So thank you for that. Yeah. Is there another tradition or religion that's coming to your heart that as I've been like chattering on that you're like, yeah. this is another thing that I discovered in my study. Yeah. So, so something that I thought to share I can't remember what year of my undergrad it was, but it was I, it was a world religions class. And I remember like, it's supposed to be an intro class. Like it's supposed to be your first class you take in the major. Something happened where that wasn't the case for me. And so I took it after gaining a lot more knowledge and experience in the academic pursuit. But I took this course and it was with my advisor who we can get to it, but taught me everything there is to know about being respectful towards various faiths. But he taught this course and he, you know, we, we did all the main world religions, Islam, Buddhism, Christianity, Judaism, Hinduism. And he sort of centered each, um, each unit or each faith on like one book. And, and often we talked about like one holiday or, um, like we sort of just did like one little glimpse into it as opposed to trying to do like a comprehensive. Um, and, you know, we go through every faith. And as I mentioned on Saints Unscripted, my advisor just has the most amazing gift about speaking about each faith as if he is, you know, the number one missionary for that faith or the number one leader, just so much reverence, so much awe, so much respect. And the final faith that we covered in the course was Islam. Um, this was 2000, uh, maybe 18. And so um, Islamophobia was high, was high. And um, the, the theme that he chose to really lie down on was obedience mm. um, and like, militant obedience and i was like really frustrated by that in defense of people who practice islam and and just felt like you know obedience at this point in my life i was thinking like obedience like you're talking about these people like they're sheep and this is why we think that they're all terrorists and you know i and and i marched into his office and I was like, why did you portray them with this ugly like theme? And he said something, I mean, so gently, he said, you might think obedience is ugly, but it isn't and it's not for them. And it doesn't lead, that is not, you know, that is not a reason that there are terrorists and and he just corrected me. And, and, and that was another moment where I realized like good and bad is such a sticky qualification to make of anything because without any context, it just falls flat. And now, of course, with the covenants I've made 
in the LDS faith, I'm all on board for obedience, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I but understand. You're, but you're right. I think generalized modern day cultural approach to obedience is not celebrated. I think right. we, when we see it practiced exactly by any tradition, we think um, we have a fear trigger or a warning figure trigger, right? Like, right. I often say within my faith, following a prophet, right, is really for me following God, which in Bible language makes sense, but in modern language looks like I'm blindly following, right. or if I'm going to live by a certain code for how I eat or dress or which we do in our faith, that's not necessarily modern day celebrated. Like it's right. a lot, like culturally right now, it's like you do you, right. you be, you express you. And so um, correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding of like a correlation that might help our audience that isn't as familiar with Islam is that in the same way we would not say a terrorist is Islamic or Muslim, um, because I think those are the two groups of people that sometimes are linked to terrorism. Is that true? I think it's like a, a very version stereotype, you yes. know, but in the same yeah. way, we wouldn't say the Ku Klux Klan, the KKK are Christians. That's the right. analogy I was taught that like, instead of relating these extreme groups to these religions, we wouldn't say a KKK group is a Christian group, even though right. they had those pillars of belief the uh, if if a terrorist identifies as islam with islam that that is a fraction that is choosing that behavior but it's not the principle or the pillar of that faith yeah and you know what you know what's so important to me when we talk about these things is all across the board it's people it's people it's people it's people and 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 that matters in the sense that, like, the reason that we don't say that Muslims are terrorists or terrorists are Muslims or the Ku Klux Klan are Christians or Christian, you know, the reason we do, do not say that is it's not the religion, it's the humanity and the weaknesses that come from that, which is universal. And at, at least this is my conviction. This is my personal opinion. And so... You know, it's a very common um, apologetic or defensive quip to say, well, every faith has skeletons in the closets. The LDS practice, practice polygamy. The Catholics have, you know, they've had a lot of sexual assault issues. Or, you know, we can, we can do it with every faith, right? right. And, and every faith has skeletons in the closet. And of course, that, that, is, that is true. And we can look at every faith and see the divinity and the yes. good. And, yes. and, and like, I, your, yeah. and like your grandmother of like, I always say we, we sometimes deify our politicians now right. and we politicize our deity and our religion. And I think yeah. one of the beautiful things I kind of feel is that the real work of religion and faith and even politics is happening on main street with neighbors it's not happening in the halls of congress or yeah. in a cathedral or even in rome or in salt lake where you know it is the everyday people and how they ap apply their faith for good or for bad right? right for good or for bad in all walks of life and so what a beautiful reminder i just felt like that was a really good awareness of like think of an extreme Christian group and you wouldn't call all Christians that group. And right. so when we sometimes hear a headline or read a headline about a terrorist group and we connect it to a religion, we need to kind of stop there and realize there's not a direct line. It's, right. it's, it's an, it's people that chose that behavior. Right. Yeah. This is a perfect, I think, segue into then you've done these academic level studies and I know you have shared and maybe we'll put that in the link, um, your Saints Unscripted episode. Can you share with us just in the last few minutes that we have about your your curiosity and your conversion? Um, I loved what you shared on Saints Unscripted and how, you know, it's these humble little missionaries that don't really know and they acknowledge their inadequacies. And because I have had children serving and one serving now, it's just a beautiful, imperfect plan of like yeah. 18 to 20 year olds that are generally out there with 
very limited, humble knowledge and um, unique personalities sharing their faith. And they're volunteering. For those that are listening to this that are not LDS, if you come across Mormon missionaries, they are paying their own way. They are leaving their homes sometimes up to two years. Girls generally are 18 months. And and they are they are in their very much vulnerable imperfectness trying to share their faith. And so whether or not you care about having a conversation about faith, just know that if you encounter these little Mormon missionaries, they're just paying their own way and away from their families and and doing their best. You know? uh, yeah. And I, I love that. I love that. Um, the word that's coming to mind is plug, but I just, I, I think something that I have to remind myself and I try and apply this to literally as many people as I can, I try to make it everyone. Every single person is doing the best they can with the information that they have. Amen. Amen. And so even if you're in a space where you're not a fan of the missionaries, the LDS missionaries, just remembering that they're doing their best. And then of course, like urging missionaries and other members of our church to remember that others are doing their best as well. Right. I, love um, that. I love that. To get into my curiosity and my, um, my conversion and my appreciation of my faith, I really, I do want to sort of carry along that theme of your grandmother and her temple packet, because I really do feel like I brought my, you know, we talk about in baptism being born again and being born new. And the reality of, of the situation is, especially when you're baptized as an adult, like you emerge from the waters and so much has changed and so much has stayed exactly the same. Mm -hmm. I brought all of my baggage with me into my membership. I brought all of what I loved about the Catholic Church with me. I brought all of my, you know, trauma and things about religion that were not easy. I brought that all with me. Um, and and I just think that's I think that's an important thing to note. I joined the LDS Church at the end of the day because it felt like a spiritual home. And from the moment I encountered it at age 16, something about my heart just called out to it. Um, to this day, I struggle to articulate why or what that was, but I just, I felt like the yearnings of my soul, which if you've watched my Saints Unscripted you, uh, view, you know that my soul has not always rested easy, but I felt like the yearnings of my soul, um, they, they, they could, they would be safe to explore within the LDS, um, doctrinal structure and and I'm, I'm i'm grateful to that and i'm grateful for um my my loved ones outside of the church who have made space to respect that and i'm grateful for my loved ones within the church who respect that i'm navigating these truths within a framework that is not a framework that is built going to seminary as a teenager there's so much that I'm still like, that's really weird that we do that. Uh, but Hey, just to make you feel better. I feel that way sometimes too. And I've yeah. grown up with it all. So yeah. I think that goes back to our natural, healthy curiosity. I think yep. I try to tell my kids conversion is not at eight when you're baptized or in 20, when you're baptized, it conversion is a daily choice every day. And it's if, so you've, true. if you've been raised in a certain religion that you are still identifying with, you still need to choose to convert daily. And God's big enough for all your baggage and all my baggage and all my questions and all your questions. And, and he, wants, for, he wants them. He wants and, them. He wants them. And he wants you to, you know, to worship him the way you are going to worship. Yes. Him. Um, That's why I always say he speaks to us in our own language. That means like, if you hear him better in the woods, great. If you hear yeah. him better listening to praise music, great. If you hear him better when you're journaling and meditating and doing yoga, awesome. I hear him a little bit everywhere. So I kind of need to shake it up. I have to be at church, be in the temple, be in meditation, be outside. And yeah. so I think sometimes in any tradition, you can start to be traditional and say, well, this is the way God speaks. But I love that in my perception of my Mormonism, 
is there's a lot of intersections. There's a yeah. lot of ways in which God speaks in to a different learner. And that's probably because the teacher in me is like, I'm a verbal learner, as you can probably tell. And so I love that we have once a month where everyone that is a verbal learner gets to stand up and testify, yeah. right? Yeah. And then I love that there's others that are like, please don't ask me to speak, but yeah. I'll see. And, yeah, yeah. and then there's others that are just so more educationally based and they understand the scriptures and they can articulate or the it. ward clerk who just wants yes! to be like bare bones helpful. And that's how he worships. Yes. He worships. Yeah. Yes. I yeah. love that. Can you, can you articulate? I love that you were honest of like, I can't even articulate the yearning of my heart since I was 16, but is there one maybe key doctrine for those that are never have never been members of, of the LDS faith that it just, it made sense to you or it felt like a puzzle piece. And I don't want to put words in your mouth, but yeah. Was there a doctrine, like, I know some of my key doctrines that for me, they're just my solid why. And yeah. when I get lost in the weeds over here, or there's something problematic in history over here, or culturally, I don't like something here or a handbook change over here. Yeah. Those core things are, are, are like my compass. That is such a good question. I think, so here's what, here's what I feel compelled to tell you. And I, I, you can't let this podcast end without there's a story that I really feel like I need to tell okay. but it doesn't answer this question but let me let me start answer this it. question and then you just share you go okay. right in the story you go right in the story so okay so but here when I was a teenager and a college kid and I was wishing that I could be Mormon um and and, and sort of disturbed that I wished I could be Mormon um <laughs> <laughs> which which whole another can of worms but yeah um i was so lost and i just wanted someone to tell me what to do yeah. and i knew that that's like not really a thing that ever happens in any space and if it is a thing a thing that's happening it's probably not for the best yeah um, but it's what I wanted. It's what I felt like I needed. And I joined this church and I felt like, you know, if I have to, I'm putting air quotes for those who can't see, if I have to follow the word of wisdom, if I have to follow the law of chastity, maybe then I'll feel, you know, happy and stable. When I actually did join that church and I did try and do those things and I did follow you know, the code of conduct as it stands to the best of my ability and failed sometimes, I realized who those commandments came from, Jesus Christ. And every day I wake up more and more to the fact that he is not in the business of telling me what to do. There is nothing more valuable in this world to him than my agency. Yes. And I love it and I hate it at the same I, It is so scary to me and sometimes i wish this is like totally blasphemous sometimes i wish satan's plan won and we were just but but i know in like a deep down unreachable part of my soul that it's the way it's supposed to be and you know what this is a good transition into my story my mom always told me no one can tell you what to do. You have to tell yourself. My mom is not a member of the LDS church. And this past spring, my husband and I visited over general conference weekend, um, the Joseph Smith birthplace in Vermont. And you, for those who haven't been, you walk into this visitor center that's sort of like a remake of the home, the family home. And the first thing that the missionaries, their senior missionaries do is they show you a portrait of Joseph Smith's parents. And she, my husband and I were, were the only two there. And she asked us about our parents. And my husband, you know, was a raised a member of the church. And he talked about that. And he has the best parents ever. And, and I talked about my parents. And they're also the best ever. But I, I did say, I said, they didn't raise me in this church. And, and she said, well, they did something so right to give you the spirit and the mind to accept this gospel. It was one of the most profound spiritual experiences of my life because 
they didn't use any of the language, any of the jargon, any of the culture, any of it. They brought me to Catholic church and they, you know, raised me to be the best person I could. And they told me, don't let anyone tell you what to do. And it got me here. And it's maybe not the way that my parents would have had it be, but it was the plan. And, and, and to me, that is an indication that Jesus Christ is using everyone as his foot, sho- foot soldiers. Everyone. Uh, it's, it, it was so, it was so important for me to wake up and, and realize that, um, a few, um, a month or two later, actually, when I was, when I was in Salt Lake, my mother-in-law, who I'm so close to, took me to the General Conference Center in um, Temple Square, and um, we went on the tour, and it was these two adorable sister miss- missionaries, and um, they asked, you know, who is religious, who's a member of the LDS church, who isn't a member of the LDS church. And this group of two couples, older couples, raised their hands and said, we're not a member of the LDS church, but we are religious. And they didn't share, you know, what religion they were or why they were interested in the conference center. But, you know, they were, of course, welcome on the tour. And um, we went along the tour. And um, as we stopped at various stops along this tour it became clearer and clearer that there was tension in the group so starting with there are photographic portraits of all of the living prophets and apostles of today um and one of the men and men in this group had all sorts of questions for the sister missionaries about are these men paid? How are they chosen? Is it a democratic choice? Or, And those are good, legitimate, important questions for anyone to ask. And of course, they're welcome to be asked. Um, but you could tell by the tone in his voice and, and the wording he was choosing that it wasn't coming from a place of curiosity. It was coming from a place of trying to prove criticism criticism and um and the sister missionaries you know were doing their best as well and and i i'm not sure that they were ready for necessarily prepared um but they were but they were loving and they they led with the truth that they knew and they were testifying of christ with every breath and that was wonderful to see i think for me, in that moment, and I said this to my mother-in-law in the drive home, I was so deeply uncomfortable, but I'm so glad I got to witness that in action because I realized good news, good news, though it is universal, and I'm talking like spiritual good news of, you know, who we are and what's going on with us and our and 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 God. It's universal, but we aren't going to access it the same way. And 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 the way we articulate good news, the wording and the phrasing that we choose, it's going to sound like the best news to one person and the worst news to the person next to them. And there's a million examples I could give of that, but it just it just showed me that you know somebody who has never heard something that President Russell M. Nelson has ever said or has never, you know, been on been on the grounds of a temple or been a part of a temple session, learning about those things, it, it might not sound like the good news it is. And so on all sides, we need to be patient and loving with each other because we need to recognize that everyone is just trying to tap into the good news from where they stand. I think of my mom with that. I think of, I think of my professor in college. I think of myself and 
I'm I'm probably a little bit more combative than most Relief Society sisters in this <laughs> church, but but I think we're all you know I'm from New Jersey. I'm not sure. Yeah, but, yeah, well, yeah. And now I live yeah. in Boston. Like I, yeah, I don't want you to be any different than New Jersey and Boston. I need I need you to speak up in Relief Society like you're yeah. from the East Coast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, but anyway, that was a really long winded way of saying. No, it's so beautiful of like going back to what we talked about before taping of just when you find yourself saying, I don't understand why they believe this, or I don't understand why they think this way. You saw in live time, the opposite of what I feel you have shown up in the educational spaces and in the faith spaces you've been called to, you have shown up with holy envy and curiosity. And you were watching this man that was just choosing not to. And I think I'm sad for him because I think if I was touring, I've, I've toured a mosque, the Grand Mosque in Bahrain. And um, because of the rules and law of the country, I couldn't talk openly about my faith. But we were told by our hosts that if someone asked to us directly, we could answer. And this woman who is Muslim, who is dressed in her religious clothing, in her religious building, that felt very familiar in design to my LDS temple in very many ways. And she was talking about her faith journey of rebellion and back. She wrote books like I do. She speaks like I do. She teaches like I do. Like she felt like the Muslim version of me on another side of the world. And at one point she stopped and pointedly asked me what my faith was. And I was very hesitant. I looked at our host and I was like, I don't want to go into jail for saying something, you know? And so I said, I answered and she said, oh, and she paused and it was almost uncomfortable. And she said, we have a lot in common, don't we? And I said, yes, we do. Mm. And that's it. That's all we said. And it made me cry because if I had gone in there with like, and I'm not saying I'm perfect at this, but if I had come in it with criticism and like, why do you have to cover your face? And why do you have to do this? And why did I have to cover my face to come into your building? And I would have missed this beautiful moment of really hearing and learning from her. Yeah. And then I also love that you articulated that the principle I heard you say that you loved is agency and yeah. God's agency plan is the faster, happier plan, but it opens us up to vulnerability and mistakes. And that's why the good news for you and I is Jesus Christ. Right. Um, yeah. But agency, I think what a beautiful, what a beautiful invitation for interfaith building, for curiosity, for respect and going at life without a criticizing lens is a much better way. It's harder when it's someone I'm married to or I gave birth to, but yeah. <laughs> you know, I think like you have just done a beautiful, beautiful job of like inspiring. Maybe we won't all get higher degrees in, in understanding other people's and their traditions, but um, you've given us a taste of why that makes life better. And thank you for that. You're welcome. And, and I just, I, I want to say, and I don't, I don't know why, but I think with with people that we encounter, like that man in the conference center, our knee jerk reaction is to say like, oh, like what a jerk or how disrespectful. And and that's a valid reaction. And, and I was feeling those, you know, angry, defensive feelings. We don't know the anger, the fear that he is experiencing and and I think that's important. I think that's important to acknowledge as well. But 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 I think what's so I think I think what's so precious. And you talked about this. You know, we're we're not all going to get higher degrees, and nor should we. I think the most precious, one of the most precious parts of God's plan in my in my faith and in my eyes is is that we do not have a choice but to learn from people who are different than us yes. uh, and that and and you you are doing such important work by facilitating that and i just really appreciate that thank you thank yeah. you louisa and i think that gentleman we have no idea that when we encounter i always say when i get the grouchy clerk at the grocery store it's an invitation for me to love them a little bit more yeah and we have no idea why they're in that headspace, you know, what happened at home that morning or whatever that is. And I would like to think that because those 
young, maybe less informed, prepared missionaries tried to be kind and that maybe his next encounter with someone or next question with someone of our faith may lead to a different feeling on his side. And yeah, yeah, we have no idea why. That's why I always say it's a pain problem that we're experiencing yeah. in the world is there's a lot of accumulating pain and we don't always know what to do with all this pain that compounds. And yeah. And for me, that's why I want to have interfaith conversations because yeah. maybe for you, the faith I turn to doesn't eliminate pain for you, but another faith does. And yeah. I yeah. think that's just a beautiful invitation that if, if religion doesn't work for you, I love that you taught us about the Navajos and yeah. you know, I, have, I have friends that have done shaman training and yeah. You know, yeah. I love, I love that there's ways in which God in my belief reaches all of his children. Yeah. Amen. And, no. And he's, and he's not panicked. He's not panicked when we mess it up. When, no. we get, when we get awkward, when we struggle in a relationship, when we deal with mental health, he's not panicked. No. And, and I feel like a lot is going to get worked out in days to come. And we just need to help each other keep faith because yeah. we, I believe we all need something bigger than our own lives and our yeah. own perspectives. And so for me, you have strength in my faith and I feel really honored to know you and be on the planet at the same time as you. Like yeah. I could have been born at any time and you could have been born at any time and we would have never had a stream yard yeah. tech to have this conversation. And I kind of love that my son interviewed you and then I interviewed you. I don't think we've done that yet. We haven't overlapped on, on guests. So it's a fun family connection. I yeah, love it. yeah. Yeah. And it's funny because people that know him, he never was going to do what mom does. Never. Uh -huh. Like he's just not, he doesn't need social media and he yeah. doesn't really love his picture taken. But I think I would like to say we're very similar in, in our yeah. curiosity of people yeah. and our love of people. So yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. Thank you, Louisa. Good luck with your move. Of with course. Your your new studies, please stay in touch with me because I would love to continue to learn from you and, and yeah. follow your journey. And for our friends that are listening to this, um, I hope that you have felt the spirit that I have felt and that you have felt inspired to keep your faith and keep learning and stay curious, honor the agency of one another and keep your faith in a way that inspires others to keep their faith. And we'll see you again on All Faith Keepers. Thank you.